rising along the northern banks of the River Thames within the heart of the City of London. The Tower of London emerges as a silent sentinel of ages past. The origins of this expansive fortress trace back to the 11th century. Originally built by William the Conqueror in 1078 to solidify his claim as King of England, the Tower of London is a complex of multiple buildings set within two rings of walls, built to keep intruders out. In the nearly 1,000 years of its existence, the Tower of London has fallen only once. And that's only because someone accidentally left the drawbridge down and the portcullis open. A peasant revolt sparked by a new tax which took no account of an individual's wealth or lack thereof was launched in June of 1381. 14-year-old King Richard II rode out to address those in the revolt and, oddly enough, wasn't harmed. The Archbishop of Canterbury, who was holding the purse strings and hiding in the fortress, wasn't so fortunate. When the mob of nearly 10,000 yeomen, skilled craftsmen, and laborers made it through the gates, they found the Archbishop in the chapel, praying. It took eight strokes before the Archbishop's head could be fully separated from its torso and then impaled on a spike and mounted over a gate on London Bridge. During the 15th century, the castle began to be used as a prison. Elizabeth I was one of the many prominent figures held captive in the tower. But there are those who were imprisoned, tortured, and even executed beneath the shadow of the mighty fortress, and their ghosts are said to haunt the grounds, a spectral reminder of the dark history of London and its famous tower. Today we look at some of the history and haunts of the Tower of London, a location that has been called the most haunted place in all of Great Britain. So if you're curious, let's take a walk through history. Before we get to our tales, a reminder that we have moved Curious True Crime to its own channel. Megan has been a tremendous help to me here on Curious History, and we felt it was time for her to step out from her father's shadow and have complete control over the Curious True Crime brand. So if you're into true crime stories, please head over to Curious True Crime here on YouTube. The link to the channel is in the description below. And while you're there, if you could give the channel a like and a follow, I would be personally very grateful. Lady Jane Grey became Queen of England after the death of her cousin, King Edward VI. Edward was the son of King Henry VIII, who left the Catholic Church and declared himself Supreme Head of the Church of England in 1533. Edward followed in his father's footsteps and remained committed to his Protestant upbringing. Since Edward had no children, and he did not want the crown passed to a royal who was Catholic, Edward named Jane as his heir in his last will, passing over his half-sister Mary. Jane resided in the Tower of London for nine days awaiting her coronation, but during that time, the country rose in favor of the direct royal line of succession. Then the Privy Council reversed their allegiance and proclaimed that Mary should be queen. Jane was deposed and was now a prisoner in the tower and was convicted of high treason which carried a sentence of death. Queen Mary initially spared Jane's life until Jane became viewed as a threat to the crown when her father, Henry Grey, became involved in a rebellion against the queen. On the morning of February 12, 1554, Jane was taken out to Tower Green to be beheaded. While she ascended the scaffold to be executed, it said that Jane gave a speech, ending with the words, I do wash my hands thereof in innocence before God and the face of you, good Christian people, this day. The executioner asked her forgiveness, which she granted him, pleading, I pray you dispatch me quickly. Will you take it off before I lay me down? Referring to her head, the axeman answered, No, madam. Jane blindfolded herself, but then failed to find the block with her hands, crying, What shall I do? Where is it? The deputy lieutenant of the tower helped her find her way. With her head on the block, Jane spoke the words, Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit. The axe then fell, and 16-year-old Jane Grey 
the nine days Queen of England, was beheaded in one clean stroke. According to many accounts told over the years, it's believed that Jane's sorrowful spirit roams the Tower of London's tall battlements, gazing down upon the lawn where she so tragically died. Other times, she's said to wander directly across the courtyard green. Usually seen on the anniversary of her death, Jane appears as a white, fragile figure who flickers away as soon as being spotted. But there is one time that someone got a good look at the ghost of Jane Grey. In 1957, a newly employed guard had a disturbing run-in with the ghost of Jane. Around 3 a.m. while standing watch, he heard something strike the top of his guard tower. Upon going outside to investigate, he noticed a headless white form on the battlements of the salt tower. It was only after discussing his experience with some of the other guards that he realized the significance of the date. It was the 403rd anniversary of Lady Jane's execution. The guard quit on the spot. Margaret de la Pole, Countess of Salisbury, was imprisoned in the tower as an enemy of the state. Margaret was the niece of two kings, Edward IV and Richard III. She was also related to King Henry VIII, who was the son of her first cousin, Elizabeth of York. Margaret's relationship with the crown became strained when she supported Henry VIII's first wife, Catherine of Aragon. Henry looked to end his marriage with Catherine after she failed to provide him with a male heir. The strain was further exacerbated by Margaret's son's relationship with the Duke of Buckingham, who was executed for treason. Then the unthinkable happened. Margaret's son Reginald, a cardinal in the Catholic Church and the last Catholic Archbishop of Canterbury, spoke out against the king and denounced Henry VIII as head of the Church of England. Unfortunately for Margaret, Reginald was in Italy, so Henry took his anger out on his mother. Margaret was arrested and transferred to the Tower of London, where she was imprisoned for two years. 67-year-old Margaret was sentenced to death as a Roman Catholic in Henry VIII's new Protestant England, but she didn't go quietly. When she made it to the scaffold, she refused to kneel, saying, So should traitors do, and I am none. Eyewitnesses say that the executioner on that fateful day was a wretched and blundering youth, who, unable to perform a clean execution with his axe, instead hacked at Margaret Pole's head and shoulders. But there are some who told a different story of her execution. It's said that when the executioner raised his axe, Margaret ran back toward her lodgings in what must be one of the most gruesome, botched executions in recorded history. The executioner ran after her, hacking at her around the scaffold. In severe pain and in shock, Margaret ran around screaming with the executioner at her heels, trying to finish the gruesome task until he finally managed to do so. The ghostly screams of Margaret are frequently heard on the Tower Green at the side of the scaffold, and some visitors have even claimed to witness a spectral reenactment of the bloody event, replete with the shadow of the executioner's axe cast against the tower walls. As the only child of Henry V, Henry VI stood to inherit both English and French thrones, yet Henry's life was plagued by royal skirmishes. In 1471, as the War of the Roses raged throughout England, Henry VI was imprisoned by the House of York at the Tower of London. Having lost both his crown and his son at the Battle of Tewkesbury, Henry fell into a severe melancholy. Many believed that illness and heartbreak hastened his death, but the truth may be far more sinister. Soon after Richard of York's son Edward IV seized control of the throne, the newly minted ruler, seeking to clear his own royal path, called for Henry VI's assassination. It's said that Henry was stabbed to death as he knelt in prayer in Wakefield Tower, murdered at the altar in the king's private chapel shortly before midnight.
Whether he died from murder or melancholy, Henry's spirit has been cursed to relive that faithful night. As the clock edges closer to midnight on the anniversary of his death, it's said that his ghost is seen restlessly pacing through the Wakefield Tower and in the chapel on the exact spot where he met his grisly end, as though awaiting his ill fate just one more time. Then, at the last stroke of midnight, he disappears. The second wife of Henry VIII and the first wife he executed, Anne Boleyn, is the most famous and persistent of all Tower ghosts. Anne came to Henry VIII's court as one of his wife's ladies-in-waiting. But the king soon fell for Anne after his marriage to Catherine of Aragon went awry when she failed to produce a male heir. So Henry had his marriage to Catherine annulled, citing several reasons, including the fact that she was at one time his older brother's wife. In the days leading up to her coronation as queen, Anne and her new husband stayed at the royal apartments in the tower. Anne was showered with gifts and given a personal tour by Henry himself. Sadly, less than a thousand days later, when she also failed to produce a male heir, Anne was staying in the tower's royal apartments once again, but this time it was against her will. She was accused and found guilty of adultery and treason against the king. Anne was beheaded on Tower Green on May 19, 1536. She was laid to rest in the Chapel Royal of St. Peter ad Vincula, the parish church of the Tower of London. Anne's decapitated body was originally buried in an old elm chest beneath the floor of St. Peter's Chapel. In 1876, Queen Victoria ordered that the bodies in the chapel be exhumed and reverently reburied more appropriately. It's said that the ghost of Anne Boleyn has been spotted several times at the Tower of London, now almost 500 years after her death. Whether she is reliving the bliss of being queen or the terror of her final days is unclear. Anne is usually seen near the site of her execution, which is now the Queen's house, a house Henry built for Anne, and near the altar in the chapel where her body lies. In 1864, when Captain J.D. Dundas was living in the tower, he noticed a yeoman warder acting strangely while standing in the courtyard where Anne Boleyn had been beheaded. He appeared to challenge something which Dundas recalled looked like a whitish female figure sliding toward the soldier. The guard charged through the form with his bayonet, and the figure disappeared. Another tale has one of the captains of the guard patrolling the tower at night, and seeing a strange flickering light in the chapel. He climbed to one of the windows, pressed his face against the glass, and was amazed by what he saw. Inside the chapel was a procession of lords, ladies, and knights in armor. At the center of the festivity was a delicately dressed woman who just happened to be missing her head. He remained at the window, transfixed by the otherworldly scene. Soon the lights in the chapel faded, and the procession of ghosts disappeared. The captain of the guard was left gazing through the window of a dark and empty old church. When King Edward IV died, his 12-year-old son became King Edward V. But because he was so young, his uncle, the Duke of Gloucester, assumed the duties of Lord Protector. But before the coronation of Edward V could take place, the marriage of his parents was declared bigamous and therefore invalid. On June 22, 1483, theologian Ralph Shaw preached a sermon declaring that Edward IV had already been contracted to marry Lady Eleanor Butler when he married Elizabeth Woodville, King Edward V's mother, thereby rendering his marriage to Elizabeth invalid and their children together illegitimate. A brand new statute was entitled by Parliament, and the title of king was bestowed upon the Lord Protector, making him King Richard III. Now, King Richard had a dilemma. What to do with the former King Edward V and his younger brother? Edward and his brother Richard were taken to the inner apartments of the Tower of London. Then, in the autumn of 1483, they disappeared from public view. During this period, 
Edward was regularly visited by a doctor who reported that he was like a victim prepared for sacrifice, sought remission of his sins by daily confession and penance because he believed that death was facing him. Well, he was right. While their exact fate is unknown, it's widely believed that the two young boys were murdered, extinguishing any hope of either royal laying claim to the throne. Oddly enough, when King Richard III died at the Battle of Bosworth Field, the act was repealed, reinstating the legitimacy of Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville's children. In 1674, the skeletons of two children were discovered by workmen rebuilding a stairway in the Bloody Tower. In the orders of King Charles II, the bones were given a royal burial at Westminster Abbey, placed in an urn bearing the names of Edward and Richard. Today, the specters of the two little princes have been seen in the several locations throughout the Tower of London. In the Bloody Tower, they appear dressed in their white nightshirts, clutching each other in terror in the castle's rooms. They have also been spotted playing on the battlements, and modern-day visitors to the tower report hearing the laughter of children throughout the halls and on the grounds. The shadowy figures of two lost little boys, holding hands, are a relatively common sight in the White Tower as well. They seem to drift between rooms and vanish into walls. Even children of preschool age who couldn't possibly know the history have reported seeing the two youths in funny clothes. Lady Arbella Stewart was an English noblewoman who was fourth in line for the throne. Arbella secretly married Lady Jane Grey's nephew, William Seymour, who was sixth in line to the throne. This both insulted King James I, since he did not give permission, and enraged the king as he perceived this union as a threat to his throne. Arbella was put under house arrest at Lambeth, while William was sent to the Tower of London. The couple had some liberty within those walls and began writing letters to one another. In those letters, they hatched a daring plan of escape and a reunification in France. Arbella disguised herself as a man, escaped, and set sail down the Thames and out to the North Sea. William escaped as well. However, he missed the rendezvous and set sail for Calais on another ship. William's ship reached the Belgian port town of Flanders, but Arbella's ship was overtaken by King James's men before it reached Calais. She was returned to England and imprisoned in the Tower of London. She never saw William again. During her captivity in the tower, Arbella either refused to eat or was purposefully starved. She died in 1615 in the Queen's house at the age of 39. Now, like Queen Anne Boleyn, Lady Arbella is said to haunt the Queen's house. The governor of the tower, who lived in those rooms from 1994 to 2006, reported a disturbing event in which his wife was pushed so violently by some unseen force that it propelled her out of the room and into the hallway. Others have reported sighting her heartbroken ghost on the grounds on the tower, weeping. You may remember the character of Guy Fox in the movie V for Vendetta, a Hollywood adaptation of actual events that took place during the reign of King James I. The real Guy Fox was part of a group that really did plan to blow up the House of Lords and kill King James and his government officials in what was known as the Gunpowder Plot. The goal was to rid England of their Protestant ruler and replace him with his daughter, Princess Elizabeth, who was Catholic. It's said that the conspirators first attempted to dig a tunnel from a nearby house to Parliament but when they discovered an undercroft or cellar right underneath the House of Lords was available for lease, they set down their shovels, purchased the lease, and began smuggling 36 barrels of gunpowder into the space. A few of the conspirators were concerned about fellow Catholics who would be present at Parliament. This led to a drafting of an anonymous warning letter sent out to the Catholics in Parliament that read, Tire yourself into your conti. 
whence you may expect the event in safety for. They shall receive a terrible blow, this Parliament. This letter made its way into the hands of Lord Monteagle, a member of the House of Lords and a Catholic. Some historians believed he received the letter as a warning to avoid Parliament for his safety. Other historians believe he caught wind of the plot and drafted the letter himself, looking to find favor from King James. Either way, Monteagle rushed to Whitehall and showed it to Robert Cecil, 1st Earl of Salisbury, who then showed it to the King. In the early hours of November 5th, the day Parliament planned to open for the first time since it closed due to the threat of plague, the King ordered a search of the cellars under Parliament and the gunpowder room was discovered. Also discovered was Guy Fox, who had been guarding the room and was making a hasty getaway. Fox was arrested, taken to the Tower of London, and held in the White Tower. If there ever was a tower that you didn't want to be held prisoner, it was the White Tower, for it was in this tower that the most diabolical forms of torture were carried out. On November 6th, King James ordered the torture of Fox, who at the time had not even given up his real name. Now, it's unclear as to what types of torture he endured, but it must have been horrendous, and almost certainly included the rack. By the end of the day on November the 9th, Fox had endured so much pain at the hands of his tormentors that he had confessed everything, the entire plot, and all involved. In January 1606, Guy Fox and all of his conspirators were found guilty of high treason and taken to the scaffold at the old palace yard at Westminster for execution. Fox watched as his compatriots were one by one hanged until nearly dead, then quartered. When it finally it was time for Fox to pay for his transgressions, his head was placed in the noose. Then he jumped, breaking his own neck and avoiding the agony that his predecessors endured. It's said that you can hear Guy Fox's screams and cries from the council chamber in the White Tower. The screams of a man begging for mercy, pleading with his tormentors to end the excruciating torture. Sir Walter Raleigh was one of the most notable figures of the Elizabethan era. He played a leading part in English colonization of North America, suppressed rebellion in Ireland, and helped defend England against the Spanish Armada. Raleigh rose rapidly in the favor of Queen Elizabeth I and was knighted in 1585. He was granted a royal patent to explore Virginia, paving the way for future English settlements. In 1591, he secretly married one of the Queen's ladies-in-waiting, without the Queen's permission, for which he and his wife were sent to the Tower of London. After his release, they retired to his estate at Sherborne, Dorset. In 1594, Raleigh sailed to find the City of Gold in South America and published a book that contributed to the legend of El Dorado. After Queen Elizabeth died in 1603, Raleigh was imprisoned in the Bloody Tower, this time for being involved in the plot against King James I and trying to replace the king with our aforementioned Arbella Stewart. In 1616, he was released to lead a second expedition in search of El Dorado when men led by his top commander ransacked a Spanish outpost, violating both the terms of his pardon and the 1604 peace treaty with Spain. Raleigh returned to England and to appease the Spanish, was arrested and imprisoned for a final time in the Beauchamp Tower. The Spanish ambassador demanded that Raleigh's death sentence be reinstated by King James, who had little choice but to do so. Raleigh was beheaded in the old palace yard at the Palace of Westminster on October 29, 1618. After he was allowed to see the ax that would be used to behead him, he mused, this is a sharp medicine, but it is a physician for all diseases and miseries. Raleigh's final words spoken to the hesitating executioner were, what dost thou fear? Strike, man, strike. Many years, guards have reported seeing Sir Walter Raleigh's ghost holding his head in his hand as it continuously drips blood. 
even soldiers with long service records have fainted at the sight. One night in January of 1893, Private James Godson was assigned to the infamous Trader's Gate. At 3.10 a.m., a gunshot rang out. Other guards rushed to the location of the gunshot to find Godson passed out with his rifle discharged. The guards revived Godson and asked him what happened. At 3 a.m., Godson saw a cart being wheeled around the corner gate. Godson challenged it, but nobody responded. The cart just continued advancing towards him. He challenged it again. This time he raised his rifle when he saw the two wheels of the cart in the moonlight. The cart was bloody contained a headless body. Then the cart disappeared. Moments later, a man dressed in doublet and hose, ruffled to the neck, with no head above the ruffle, came through the wall. Terrified, Godson cocked his rifle and shouted to the ghostly man to halt. Then he noticed something underneath the ghost's left arm. It was the bloody head of Sir Walter Raleigh. The eyes stared at Godson as the ghost's beard dribbled blood. Godson fired his rifle at the ghost as the eyeballs rolled around inside the ghostly head. Godson then passed out from the fright. I can't say that I blame him. So, is it true that the Tower of London is haunted by the spirits of people who died there? I guess it depends on your own personal beliefs. Please let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you for watching, folks. I'll see you next time as we explore more curious history. Take care.